So I thought um, I might take the prerogative and perhaps ask the, the first question. Um, and, uh, and we do have people out to pass microphones. But um, Catherine, you said can science be, be, be trusted? It's a credibility issue. So how do you build trust in science in the face of critics and conflicting evidence? Um, I think um, it, it was interesting to, to, to reflect on all the different sort of perspectives here because um, there's science as it relates to the people who want the problem fixed, which is your farmers or the people who are being impacted by the problem not being fixed, your community, um, and then there's the public itself who uh, don't necessarily know that level of detail but just um, are intuitively responding to the science um, and the story of the science. Um, so I think I, I think there's, it's useful to think about those things at, at those different levels and unpack it. So um, I was doing a little systems map as I was listening to everyone speak, and I put the science branch had well the total system health, like what is the outcome that we actually want? That's the vision. What is um, and what is the role invasive species plays in relation to that, and what can we do to help protect it? I think that's sort of builds upon what the science might be for a vision that we could all buy into. And then there's the science as in what are all the different scientific views and how do we try and close those gaps and deal with the uncertainty as well as possible and in a way that might build knowledge of the public and to enhance um, the connection between the people who are impacted, the community at large and the public um, to that. Um, so I sort of, I'd like to basically propose that you need to think of it at those levels. Okay. Question up the, up the back there, yep. George Anthony, uh, Queensland Department of Agriculture. Uh, first of all, a mild disagreement with the uh, chair. I think economics is very much part of all this, uh, very much belongs here. Uh, good economics is working uh, hand in hand with Cathy's uh, Dave, especially the E of it, and tries to uh, show the full extent of uh, uncertainty. We try to keep up with, uh, uh, sorry, Catherine's Dave. Uh, we try to keep up with Cathy uh, in his travels, probably not successfully, and uh, very much follow uh, Greg's uh, impact assessment. Now, a question is uh, what I have to Greg especially. Uh, aren't we doing ourselves a bit of a disservice uh, calling uh, wild dogs wild dogs? Confuses the issue a little bit. Uh, they are really ferals. The wild dogs are the dingoes that we don't mean to harm all that much. And especially when it comes to wild horses, uh, the social so uh, license to operate in that space is very much disadvantaged by calling them not ferals. Mm. Greg? Mm. I'm going to the economics one later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pressure, Greg. Thanks for that. Um, so the disservice, you're right. Um, in fact, the majority of what we control is actually dingoes. We use the term wild dogs because under each state's legislation, any dog that doesn't reside on a protected area is considered to be a wild dog. But in fact, the majority of what we control are wild living, free ranging dogs, whether you want to call them dingoes or not. They're not feral dogs as such. So we had this debate last night at dinner. Um, and perhaps we're causing some of the, our own disservice by separating the two out because of the push now to say, well, we should be leaving dingoes in the landscape. So I think it is, it is a difficult position to be in because we, we have to act, and most of the invasive species stuff that we start to commence working on is as a result of um, those impacts, economic and otherwise, that have been identified in, in most of the different states' legislation, and, and hence the terminology. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Question at the back there. Uh, Rick, Sinclair, Rick Sinclair from Forest and Products Australia. Um, a question that reflects on the past, because we're trying to deal with this trust deficit um, on a number mm -hmm. of areas. Uh, once upon a time, we had the Resource Assessment Commission, which acted as an independent body to um, to try to get a more uh, understanding of some of these complex contested ideas. Is there a potential role for a standing body like a productivity commission to actually deal with social licence issues across the economy? Mm. 
<coughs> I think it's a question to, to all the panels. Would someone like to volunteer first? Well, I, I would just suggest that there are actually some mechanisms in play here already. It's not, it's not absent. Um, and I'll give you the example that some of the industry groups, for example, have really, you know, stepped up and thought through some of the ways in which they can um, broker some of those processes. The consultative committee that's been established under the deed, I think in Australian context, is a, a great moment where we're allowing some dialogue with industry leaders and government to talk through that to talk through those issues both in the plant and health committee spaces. But I reckon Greg made a really good point that context matters. Um, and so, you know, when you start to put on some too broad a brush on these things, you can lose the nuance of stakeholders' values, knowledge, and what the pathways for that social licence is going to play, whether that be in, you know, Victoria is going to be different, as you said, to, to South Australia. So it is tricky. Um, I think the nuance of this is that that local context matters um, and thinking through those pathways to get there. Yeah, I, I, I think there's some merit in the idea, Rick, because um, there are some elements that are just genuine trust deficits, as in 25% well, of people uh, now um, trust government, which equates to 75% you know, sort of being on the not trusting side, and same goes for corporations. So there's a, a sort of broader economy-wide problem, which means that if you want to do your solutions at the community level or the stakeholder level, you've got a higher bar to jump just because you, you're in the context of a trust deficit. Um, but the, the challenge is um, how to uh, create that shift. And I think, you know, from my understanding, the Business Council um, of Australia, uh, the government, many boards are now trying to grapple with this, uh, but their approach is what I would generally call an old-fashioned public relations approach. It's a benefit selling. Let me tell you how much taxes we pay if we don't have tax losses in the past. <laughs> How much we would pay if we could pay it. Um, you know, so taxes, how many jobs, all of those kinds of benefits that the industry might uh, provide as the rationale to offset all the negatives. And I think that's broadly why the social licence challenge is there at a macro level, that those things do not trade off in that way. And, um, and I think if we could just break the way that um, people think around benefit selling in the face of risk, uh, that we would do a huge advance um, at the macro level, and then obviously that it would change the dynamics at the local level. Yeah, so I've written about this. You can see it on the Sora Ecos stuff. Um, but I, I, and I guess it's something that we're really exploring because if you actually start from that ground up view, you realise there's a bunch of other priorities before biosecurity kicks in. Um, and also that that affects the way in which they'll deal with those invasive species, um, whether they see them as a resource or as a, as a curse. Um, and also how management solutions need to be um, encompassed in that. Um, so there's a lot of work we're doing now particularly in Northern Australia, is absolutely about that. So, you know, some of this is about, is there viable environmental service enterprises we can deliver? Is this just as part of that conversation as, can we knock off the pigs? Mm. You know, because if you can't think about... So the next workshop I'm running in Arnhem Land is about buffalo business. That's what they've t titled it. Now, that's, isn't that interesting? Buffalo business. What an interesting combination of terms. You know, in other words, business is on the table as much as buffalo because it's food for families... 
as much as a mustering opportunity, as much as a surveillance opportunity, as, and how can they get good data so that they can provide a data service. So those things have to be embedded if we're going to do anything of use in that area. <coughs> so I think that total system health that brings in livelihood options, economic you know, things from that regional perspective, particularly in resource poor remote communities, I've found to be just key. I also think, and the thing I alluded to about that Panama, if we think about biosecurity as a total system response, that actually has to think through some of the, I mean, let's face it, some of these areas that are facing things like Myrtle Rust or, you know, Panama are actually regional development challenges. What are we going to do to get communities to rethink new industries and land use? What are we going to do with these new scenarios when we've got different species or impacts that are happening? So I guess what we're finding is that we're finding that there's a lot of interest now to rethink this as actually a regional transformation question mm. as much as it is as a biosecurity control question. So that's where we're exploring now in Soro. I'm just trying to think that, rethink that through. And of course that starts to bring in other players to the table, health, industry, mm. regional development, local councils. Mm. So yep, really keen to anyone who else is keen on that to, to chat. Deb Kerr from Australian Pork Limited. Um, obviously working for the pork industry, animal welfare and social responsibility around animal welfare is a, quite a topical thing. Um, I want to sort of explore the contested spaces in the context of land use planning and what we're seeing is an increase in activism around producers who wish to expand or to put in place greenfield sites. And so the area I'm really interested in comment from the panel on is to whom is social licence owed? When you've got social media, you've got people from around the world who can lodge a submission to a local council. So to whom is that social licence owed? Is it the local community? Is it the local council area? Is it the state, the nation, or is it global? Mm. Oh, can I take mm. yeah. <laughs> um, Thanks, Deb. That's a great question. Um, the, um, I think you literally have to think at multiple levels all the time. So uh, it, it's basically saying, yes, it's global, because the global question for pig farmers is, do we need to eat meat? You know, um, then uh, yes, it's local because the question is, what is the best use of land, uh, and is pig farming the best use of land for that um, particular location? Um, and um, yes, it's your your activists who are concerned about what your animal welfare practices are. Uh, yes, it's you know, it's essentially literally a stakeholder-wide analysis, then the question is that when people do a social licence analysis, they often do what I call, uh, what they consider the legitimate stakeholders. Um, they're the people they like listening to, um, not the people they don't like listening to. So I, I would suggest that, in a sense, your social licence is as it stands um, with the people who support you, but the risk to your social licence is with the people who do not um, and who will increasingly will not. And um, it's bringing together how those pieces might um, put your organisation or industry at risk that is a vital thing to do if you want to forecast the rate of change required for your industry. And just to add to that, it is intimately connected to program effectiveness, the concept, right? So it's not just so, like, do we care if Fred Nurk out in Woi Woi is complaining? Mm -hmm. Possibly not. And so our challenge is that we, because we haven't done that thinking around does it affect program effectiveness, we actually spent a long time on Fred out at Woi Woi because we have, haven't done that analysis of will that affect our program effectiveness at all. So you're absolutely right. Some of that, what we're, I guess, advocating here is pay attention to where you need to have social licence or not to, a, to, achieve your social, um, to, to achieve your program effectiveness. The intimacy between that program effectiveness can't be lost. So, you know, attention to which stakeholder matters for what pathway is key. Um, on that note, the US National Organic Program, of which many organic certifiers and, and many rangeland properties, where we have most of our critical weight range threatened species, um, aren't permitted to use 1080, which is the most appropriate target-specific environmentally sensitive toxin we have for pest control. So we have huge swaths of land out there um, in Western New South Wales and places where we cannot physically apply adequate control 
Um, and that's all because of a perception that was created in the US in 1971 about the use of 1080 for their landscape. So yeah, <laughs> it's global and doesn't matter what space you're in. And Rick will remember it's because of forestry as well. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Elise Heraldwoods. I'm from the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. I incidentally work in Matt's division. <laughs> he doesn't know this question. Um, my question, I've got, I've had a very long standing interest in social licence. Um, and uh, for me, it comes down a lot to um, uh, developing and institutionalising empathy and emotional intelligence in all of those involved in the situation. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that we don't train for this very well. It's quite difficult to train for emotional intelligence and for true empathy. Um, and I think in the circumstances that you've all uh, set out in your presentations today, um, having insight into the true nature of the stresses and the concerns and the values of your stakeholders is absolutely key to ensuring that you have a successful outcome. My question is, given that that is such a key factor, how do you build that capacity within the, the government um, in particular, but also um, in industry without without relying on sociologists and anthropologists and people who have that specialist training? How do we get it more pervasive mm. um, within the workforce? Um, and then how do we ensure that we take that into account appropriately when we're actually dealing with time-critical, highly urgent response situations in a biosecurity context, mm. where if you don't act within a very short period of time, the consequences will be very significant mm. and much more mm. significant than they currently are. So when we're talking about very time critical situations and we don't have necessarily the opportunities to go out and engage at the grassroots level mm. and build that trust, oh, do you want to how, do we, how, how, how do we deal with those situations? Yeah, look, that, that's a really tough one. Um, I've, I don't have, well, our biggest issue is that our engagement processes are 10 years long. Um, I went and did some community engagement courses and got really frustrated because they were talking about very short-term infrastructure type approaches. You know, we're going to go and build a toilet in the park. We're going to ask the community what colour they want the dunny doors and we're going to paint them a different colour because we didn't get paint. We go out and tell them and inform them. And that's it. And I was explaining how we're taking community groups from here to here to here to here across their entire engagement spectrum over a period and they couldn't comprehend it. Um, We've set up a, a community of practice amongst those coordinators and any other the government agency staff that are involved in this space. And we do bring in expertise to talk about empathy and conflict management. Um, I guess I've become a bit of a, a mentor there and, and looking for information all the time about conflict transformation and stuff. They're, they're long-term approaches. Um, your situation, I think, is probably best for these guys because I, we're dealing with entrenched issues that take time. Um, and I haven't had to deal with any, except for maybe ready slider turtles, but everyone wanted to get rid of them, so it was easy. Um, so I want to flip back. The shift in engagement between passive surveillance and emergency control and then, and then after emergency control is unbelievable. Mm. And we don't actually charge ourselves very well between those different shifts in that program cycle. Mm. And then we do it again in the same region for another pesty that comes in at different times. And so, in any given time, your friendly officer has turned into a cooperative, helpful person to control. Actually, folks, you've just got to rip the bananas, right? So, so part of that thinking through the whole cycle, and if we don't actually change the way in which we interact to reflect those different parts of the program and what we have to do is part of that challenge, right? So we have kind of done a bit of an uh, uh, overall approach, mm. the dunny door approach, to biosecurity engagement whether it's passive, emergency or post. So that's step one. Two is who we bring to the table, I think. So I was really struck by, you know, is this just a biosecurity issue? I don't think so. Um, so part of that, I think, is uh, the maturity as, uh, as we move this shared responsibility into a mature space, I guess bringing in other partners to play here that can bring in these other partnerships of community capacity. So we've talked about community resilience to biosecurity a fair bit in our work. Um, and that is building that resilience. And we've worked out that that pathway might not be from a biosecurity officer. 
Mm. Might be from Vinnie's, mm. you know. Um, so taking those pathways quite seriously, um, we're just trying to collect a bit of evidence for that to say building resilience to communities so they can handle the next biological invasion and then some actually has that kind of more holistic approach. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think from an organisational point of view, uh, in order to build this, em this true empathy that you're asking about, there's systems, which is your risk systems can't just be about technical risk. They need to be about outrage risk or the public intuition, and it addresses, therefore, some of those conflict issues and interprets and, and, and allows you to anticipate those. So um, if your systems address it, your strategy, as in do I really want to know what the community thinks or what the critics might think uh, in order to go from where we are now to where we want to go to, that's essentially a strategy, um, then you would be thinking about people in relation to that. And as a result of having that, uh, those two things in place, then the, the need to have a capability uh, increases. So you can actually structure that capability training. Uh, things like, for instance, we teach generative listening. So the difference between active listening, nodding your head, you know, <laughs> generating a new idea that comes out of an interaction so that it resolves conflict, being able to assert versus um, compete uh, in terms of your um, opportunity to, co you know, collaborate differently. There's a whole set of skills that we aren't teaching people, that we could teach people, um, that it could be then in a form. So when we've been doing things like cultural change to support social licence, we create those capability shifts um, in, in the process. So ideally your incentives, your job roles, your accountabilities, etc., change. So we did one for an environmental regulator where we said, okay, well, if you want to make your way to being a regional manager, these are the kinds of skills that you have to have, A, learned, B, demonstrate, to get to the point where you have to deal with regional level risk. Um, that is not just technical risk, it's also community risk. So it sort of uh, professionalises the concept of empathy um, and, and, and sort of stabilises it in the system. And I think that's necessary because we've done that for all the other um, credible technical assessments of the issues. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for a great set of presentations. Um, it's Tracy Henderson here from Sugar Research Australia. Um, I guess I was just reflecting on the presentations yesterday and the consumer, uh, I guess, pull or demand for increasing uh, standards and, I guess, agriculture's response to that. Um, and I was just keen to hear your views on uh, whether you felt agriculture is doing enough to maintain our social licence to operate. Um, is it... Is agriculture as a whole, not specific topics or regions or industries, just as a whole, where do we stand, I guess? And then uh, I think we need to do more. So in anticipating a possible opportunity to do more, um, I guess just building on from the last question and the last discussion, uh, what high priority uh, opportunities exist to help agriculture maintain and improve its position, uh, you know, in a national sort of sense to uh, maintain and improve our social licence to operate. Thanks. I mean, there are standards out there that, you know, other industry groups have thought about in terms of their social acceptability um, and thinking about what they call co-benefits of their operation and metrics around that. Um, and so I've done that in the carbon industry, for example, in, a, in another part of my life where we've just thought about some of that co-benefits for farmers. Um, that's built basically about sustainability goals, but that also talks to what are those sort of social dimensions of that operation that can exist. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, in particularly in biosecurity, um, I think that point be before about when this is on high speed, um, that gets really hard to, to maintain a standard particularly. Um, and so that shift between passive and, and active, I think we call it peace and wartime, which is problematic terminology, but, um, you know, just that, that moment has to be um, embedded in that standard, though, I would think, because it matters. Um, yeah. Great. Just quickly, I mean, is agriculture doing enough to impress upon people where the food comes from to start with? I mean, is that, is that the gap first? Because, I, I mean, I've, I've got young kids and, you know, 
I wonder whether that's part of the gap. The social licence aspect is that, that, that would, the rest of the community might be divorced from where their food comes from and how much effort and time and concern and welfare goes into its production. And potentially, it might be sort of putting a cart before the horse. Um, that's just a... Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, we have our first disagreement, Greg. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, one of those. I think it's sort of... I mean, everyone would have to put food security up as a, a critical human uh, requirement. So I don't think it's a desire to undermine food security that gets people to be concerned about agriculture or the loss of social licence mm. in relation to agricultural practice. So um, I think it's a... Uh, if you like, I almost think it oppresses or represses the level of concern because people are fearful of changing the system too much as to undermine the system that provides us food. Um, so uh, my suggestion is you actually have to face into your issues that people are concerned about and um, address them effectively. So... Yeah, Bernie, I wonder, I'm a freelance consultant. My, my question um, is a bit of a variation, if you like, of uh, an earlier one. Um, and it has to do with vested interest, right? Uh, and that is, you know, I fully appreciate what you say, um, Catherine, the question's to you, um, regarding uh, the advantages of the DAVE approach and uh, in order to generate social licence. But at the end of the day, um, you, we all frequently encounter circumstances where powerful vested interests are at play and that they're going to be irreconcilable, basically, because at the end of the day, people are maximising different objectives, towards different objectives, and uh, it comes down to analysis of uh, what's the best public policy decision, right? Yep. So I'm sort of led to sort of think that, well, Dave's great, but Dad's not dead, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put that, I mean, on an issue where um, the immaturity uh, of the social, social curve that I, I laid out, and the details are in that website I mentioned, if you are below the bottom half, you can absolutely do Dad. Uh, in other words, traditional strategies, ignore, deny, defend, attack, they work because, um, you know, the majority of people aren't highly concerned. So this issue of public engagement, the public being concerned, um, isn't going to be the trigger that undermines your um, political or regulatory rights to operate. Um, however, if you do that, you've got to remember people have a long memory. So the resources curse was reasonably um, immature as a concept as it related to developed country when uh, it was proposed by Rudd. Uh, but when the mining industry reacted the way they did, the uh, concerns about it matured considerably. <laughs> and um, it is now above the bottom half, and now taxes in places like Western Australia that were never considered before by a pro-mining state is being considered. So um, I, I just say, yeah, a dad can work in some situations, but you've got to watch the strategy. Okay. Mm -hmm.